Good evening and welcome, all you stalwart members of Climate Crisis Policies Adopt a District Program. Uh, at the moment, we have eight bills out of the 12 bills we are pushing that are currently live in Congress that is available for co sponsorship, and then we hope we'll all go forward to a vote. Um, and this evening, we've invited two people who can help us deepen our understanding of the bills in our package. We've asked Jean Paul Cortens to help us better understand the Agricultural Resilience Act. And we've asked Eric Weltman to ground us more solidly in the N Polluter Welfare Act. So, first, let's turn to Jean Paul, who has farmed for over 30 years in New York State and with farms in the Hudson and the Mohawk Valleys. Tonight, he brings us his expertise in organic farming and in soil health. The Agricultural Resilience Bill that we're pressing in Congress intends to encourage farmers to adopt practices that promote carbon sequestration, healthy soil, and pasture-based livestock raising. Often practices like these are called regenerative agriculture. Sean Paul, can you start by explaining what's meant by regenerative agriculture and why it matters? I think regenerative agriculture is um, a term that people have started to use because they felt that the word sustainable um, no longer really was sufficient to address, um, you know, an agriculture that would be more progressive. Uh, sustainable means that things stay the way they are. And um, while sustainable is better than being exploitative, um, I guess regenerative, the idea would be that um, you're also building soil, um, so you're leaving the, the ground better than when you found it. Uh, generally speaking, when we are talking about regenerative agriculture, uh, people really define three different um, areas, uh, soil health being one of them, um, but the other aspect is animal welfare, um, and then the last one is social fairness. So it is not just that regenerative is only about agricultural practices. Um, it is also really about like, how do you um, uh, in, interact with your workers, for example. Um, some of the um, work that has been done by some of the organizations that now want to certify regenerative agriculture, they actually have a rating system whereby they're looking at all these different aspects. So for example, they will quantify, you know, how a farmer builds um, soil health, uh, what are their practices, and they will grade them. Uh, same thing with animal welfare. They will look at like, well, to what extent are these animals really living the life that they're supposed to be living? And the more they are close to their natural being, the higher the grading. The same with social fairness, I think, um, we know that agriculture is um, very exploitative when it comes to labor. Um, so uh, are farmers paying living wages? Do they make long-term commitments um, to their labor? Uh, do they offer housing? Do they have the um, freedom um, to um, you know, uh, um, congregate as workers and negotiate? Um, is there capacity building? Those kind of things are really uh, what you're talking about. So that is somewhat what people talk about regenerative. I think that generally speaking, there is an assumption um, that farmers are organic, uh, but not necessarily so. I think what we're seeing is that the um, uh, especially in Europe right now, um, there is more of a tendency that um, organic <clears throat> and um, farms that are adopting regenerative practices, even if they're using synthetic inputs, are coming pretty close together when it comes to either the, the, the basis of soil health, animal welfare, and social fairness. Um, and part of that is also um, uh, uh, how uh, things are being legislated in the terms of what chemicals are actually allowed. Um, just, you know, just a little anecdote is that um, a friend of mine builds weed control um, machines. And um, 
And so he was saying like, well, what is your biggest customer? He said, well, my biggest customer right now are not the organic farmers. Um, it's really the um, uh, conventional farmers um, that no longer are allowed to use the um, uh, herbicides that used to be allowed uh, previously in the European Union. So <clears throat> their farms were actually full of weeds while the organic farms, they got their systems down and they were actually weed free and you drive by and you see that the actually conventional farms were more, more weedier. And I think this is really the direction uh, where things are going. Um, so um, I know that we talked earlier about some of the acts that are being passed in uh, Congress. Um, and a lot of them are based on carrots. Uh, I think in the European Union, there are also quite a few um, uh, sticks involved whereby um, their, um, you know, their EPA, their Environmental Protection Agency is actually um, no longer allowing certain chemicals to be used. So also the nitrogen factor is um, being reduced, the nitrogen output of agriculture is being uh, reduced quite a bit, uh, leading to a lot of protest actually by farmers. Uh, my sense is, is that this is just a matter of time. Um, where hopefully in 30 years, um, really there, there's not going to be such a um, difference between organic farms and conventional farms, but that really this whole notion about regenerative agriculture will be more addressed. Um, one thing that I want to mention as well is that the organizations that are promoting organic farming um, in Europe, um, one of them is called IFOM, uh, they bring an other aspect into the um, grading of their farms and that has to do with how much waste do they um, actually produce. Um, so to what extent um, do these farms, are they uh, energy neutral and do they uh, not generate a lot of waste? So that's actually a fourth component. So. Um, let me again repeat what those components are. Soil health, animal welfare, social fairness, and then the fourth one uh, would be a waste reduction. Um, yeah, I, I think, I hope that is sufficient in, in a painting a bit of a, a picture about what is happening there in the landscape and uh, to what extent it uh, ties into the Agricultural Resilience Act. Um, I think that ultimately, my sense is that as we are working with less and less resources in the future, that this is a direction that agriculture will take um, and that farmers are going to, um, you know, ad adapt um, to different times. What are the benefits to farmers, right, that would push them in this direction? Well, what makes me hopeful is more the environment. The, the situation is actually quite dire uh, for farmers. Um, it is not good. Um, so when I say hopeful, I don't mean hopeful from the perspective from the farmers themselves. It's actually dire. Um, right now, small dairy farmers are um, losing their business left and right. Right now, Danone, uh, just canceled a contract with uh, dairy farms that are too small. And um, it, it is basically, it's an all, it's not good. Um, I say hopeful only is that it's inevitable that um, farms um, with a tremendous output um, of nitrogen and creating water pollution, um, having the ability to, um, sequester carbon with different practices and having the ability that land can actually uh, serve as a way for water infiltration, um, reducing flooding in the future. All these things are going to be tools that will be utilized in the future um, to help to make sure that we can combat climate control, uh, the cl climate change. So I think that's kind of what I'm saying and, and as an effect, I think agricultural practices uh, will start to change. So that is where I'm hopeful about. What will happen to the farmers is all secondary. 
if they adapt and take advantage of a marketplace that actually is willing to pay a premium for these products, then they are okay. If they are reluctantly adapt, uh, often um, they will suffer. And, um, and that, that is just a, a reality. So it's not as, um, you know, rosy as, as I, I, if I say I'm being hopeful for the farmers. Got it. Um, uh, Lynn asked about carrots and, and sticks, because um, you mentioned that in the U.S., tendency toward the carrots, in the EU, more willing to use sticks, mm -hmm. right? Um, but we also have a really strong uh, difference between small, smaller family-based, we call them family farms, and agribusiness, right? Yeah. Right? Um, and you're suggesting that because other people in the society are subject to the floods, to the nitrogen pollution, uh, to the um, scarcity of crops because of soil is eroded and made into just plain dirt, right? Uh, you right. can't grow anything in anymore. Mm -hmm. um, that's where it's going to come from? I believe so. Yeah, I think it's uh, <laughs> it, it's one of these things that that um, it's going to be kicking and screaming, but I, I, I think it's inevitable um, that that will happen. And I think that's just a, um, I'm, I'm looking at how the kicking and screaming is happening uh, in Europe. Um, the farmers are not um, very cooperative uh, with these changes right now, but it's inevitable um, okay. on a higher level. People will agree that that is something that that will need to happen. Um, yeah. What will happen in the U.S.? I can't tell. It really depends on um, who, who is in control. Um, we have a very uh, divided uh, political system here. Um, so uh, as long as um, we have an administration like we have right now, I think it will be inevitable. Uh, if that changes, um, it's very possible that we're, we're going to just, you know, have policies uh, uh, in place that are, in my opinion, rather self-destructive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Mary Jane asks about scaling up, uh, about how much more land it takes to do regenerative and what <coughs> happens to food prices. And mm -hmm. you had made a reference to that, if people mm -hmm. are willing to pay, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, so, so talk about that a little bit. Well, <laughs> there, you see, this the whole thing, and we have known this since the 60s, is that there really isn't a, a food shortage. Um, there hasn't been a food shortage. We are actually able to receive uh, tremendous yields, um, both with re regenerative practices um, and um, or conventional practices. So um, what is happening right now is that a lot of land um, that is in production in the US, for example, uh, is either being exported um, for feed or it is being um, transformed into ethanol or biodiesel. So when you take that out of um, the, the picture and, um, and also if people would be willing to go more to, a, um, to have less meat in their diet, um, we have plenty land. Um, I think there's uh, there will be plenty of food for people to eat, and it will be highly nutritious. Um, it, it's not an issue. We have tremendous resources still of land available. Um, you know, am I concerned that you know we're still continue to take land out of production to and turn it into houses? Absolutely. It's um, in the end good land is only a small sliver of the totally available land base that we have. So um, humanity in order to sustain itself needs to treasure these little slivers of land that we still have. Um, when you go to the Midwest, you think it's you know an amazing amount of land that is available, but nevertheless, uh, in the total picture, um, there is a lot of deserts. There's a lot of areas where food cannot be grown. Um, but in these areas where it is not ideal uh, production land for either vegetables or grains, um, this is where 
uh, grassland comes in and where we can raise our livestock. But they were utilizing a lot of that very good land for corn and soybeans. Um, uh, that that would have to change. So, um, and will prices go up for food? Yeah, by no means. I've, I've, <laughs> the, the price of food is too low. Um, it has been, you know, artificially kept that way because that is how you make the economy grow. And um, the less people spend on food, the more they have that money available for other places. Um, but you know, this is this is an economic question. I don't know how to resolve that, but I know that farmers are underpaid, um, workers are underpaid, um, and that is more of an issue why um, uh, um, you know food is right now cheap because f farms um, are a place of exploitation. And um, if we're willing to make that change, and also in the context that we can see that farms are also a tremendous resource for water infiltration, for carbon sequestration, um, and other, just the, the whole public component of it, I think, um, and there is the political will, um, then I think, uh, I, I don't see why um, that will be a tremendous burden. So there are, of course, um, programs available to farmers, and they could be made available in the future too. Um, when they adopt these practices, that it could be supported. Um, uh, and this is really where the Agriculture Resilience Act come in, that those are filled with incentives for farmers to, to adapt and to be paid for that. And that would help then the consumer um, to not pay higher prices in the supermarket. Um, I just read a book by um, a British author called Pastoral Song, and he's a farmer in northern uh, mm -hmm. England on not very good soil, but good for sheep and, and then grains and other, other things. And he tells a, a story about, it sounds like maybe he came of age in the 70s, and his grandfather used very old methods of um, farming, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, the sheep were out in the fields and they used the manure and everything. And then for his father's generation, uh, there was a tide of modern agriculture, right? Mm -hmm. Pesticides, bigger fields, big uh, combines and things. And, but they, they, they were badly in debt. These farmers were badly in debt, often went under. Um, so that land got concentrated in fewer and fewer hands. And the soil, they began to realize that the birds were gone because there was no worms in the soil. There were no insects in the soil and stuff. And so he has gone back to his farmer, his grandfather's way of farming. But what was really interesting to me was he, he needed a lot of help. He needed agricultural agents. He needed people who were specialists in soil. He needed conservation payments. He needed easements. Uh, just the support that you just talked about, um, that he couldn't just do it on his own and, and make a living, right? Yeah. Um, it, it was quite, quite different. Um, in New York State, um, are there any particular div divisions or resistance to this that you see? I mean, I think New York State does have a strong organic farming community. It has a strong, yeah. you know, yeah. um, what it, farm to table, right? Uh, yeah. Kind of culture, farmers markets, we, for those of us that live in New York City. Nonetheless, mm -hmm. uh, there's still big agriculture here, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would say that, um, you know, a big agriculture, big ag, um, you know, they will um, go kicking and screaming. I mean, that's, a, that's the reality is that they, they will not want to adapt. And they think they, um, it will take a while for, um, for that to change. Yeah. Um, they, they will not be willing. Um, but, you know, so we just have to see how that works out. There are, um, you know, um, there, there, it's all going to be depending on to what extent um, the legislator is willing to curb some of the um, pollution that these large operations are causing. Now, having said that, 
um, just because an operation is large, that doesn't mean they're bad. So let's make that very clear. Um, size has very little to do with how good or bad a farmer is, all right? So in, when someone milks a thousand cows, to say that they're immediately because they're exploitative is not true. Yeah. You really need to take it on a case by case basis. There are some very good operations that are quite large. There are some, there are small operations that are terrible. Okay, so let's just, and just because they're organic, okay. they're not better, right? So let's just make sure that we, we have a way to assess this and to, as I said earlier, you know, are they actually building soil health? You know, are they actually better for their animals? Are they treating their workforce in a way that is, um, you know, that, that we feel that they should be treated? And are they creating a lot of waste? Uh, in context of how much they're producing, how much energy are they using? Let's look at all these aspects and then put them side by side. And then I think um, some of our conventional neighbors um, are sometimes not doing that bad. Uh, they're doing pretty good actually. So, um, and they're, they're doing it because they're smart people. They're just good farmers. They're good right. stewards. Um, interestingly, uh, we, we go out, meaning the people on this call, to their in, our individual um, co Congress people. Uh, right. And uh, this big agricultural resilience bill, uh, Senator Gillibrand has signed on. And I know she takes very, agriculture very seriously as an right. upstate New Yorker, right? Um, yeah. But none of our Congress people, except for um, Sean Maloney, uh, have signed on to this. Um, do, do you have a sense of uh, agriculture and the federal level in New York State doesn't seem to be very visible to them or interesting to them, even though it's important to the state? It's very important to the state. Yeah, I, I don't know. Okay. Um, I, 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 frankly, I, I'm, not, I'm not really um, in touch with that. Um, so, uh, and I also don't know these individuals. Um, and I think that things, um, I think a lot of things have been politicized that should not have been politicized to begin with. So um, we can just take the pandemic as an example. Why is that political? Why is it political to wear a mask or take a vaccination? Apparently it has. So I think that same thing will happen in agriculture. Um, so we, we have to be really careful what, what is going on there and um, what people are talking about, what people think. Um, so the whole, um, what I can hear people say and what their congressman probably also hears is that there are, is a large group of people out there who really doesn't like the government telling them anything. And um, so they will be resistant to anything like that because it might be like the government is telling you something. I have to say, I, I read the bill and um, it's all carrots. So who is opposed to carrots? I, I don't get it. Um, so why they are resisting to it? I have no idea. Okay. I mean, it may be that it, it has not come to their attention, in which case everybody on this call, that's our job, right? Yeah. Is to bring it to their attention, um, yeah. that they're not paying attention to agriculture as, as an issue uh, with that. Um, well, I think, yeah. I think the issue here is too that we need to make them aware that this is not just an issue for farmers. Um, this is an issue for the public at large. Um, this is about our safety. Um, this is about our future. Um, so we, 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 we just need to do the right thing here. And um, land is a tremendous um, you know, resource to be able to tackle some of these larger issues that humanity is facing in the not too distant future. So it's their obligation to think of that instead of long term, instead of short term political gain. Other questions for Jean Paul? Please. Rebecca, I have a question. Ahead. Yeah. Um, and it's maybe not totally related to the bill, but um, I was reading recently that Danone is pulling out their um, the dairy 
farms that they work with, the organic dairy farms that they work with in the Northeast that support their um, Horizon Organic brand. And yeah. they're moving that all to the South. And Correct. based on what you were saying earlier about not all organic is good, I mean, personally, I thought that this was a huge blow to the industry and really, you know, counterintuitive against what they position themselves as as a B Corps and all this stuff. And is there a way for, I mean, is there a way for this bill? Is there like, I reached, I tweeted about it and expressed my frustration in the company, which sort of fell on deaf ears, but like, how do we prevent things like that from happening? Should we be working to prevent things like that from happening? Kind of a long-winded question there, but would love to hear your take. Yeah, I don't know to what extent we can prevent it. Um, these are companies that have an obligation to their, um, you know, shareholders um, to create profit. And they have determined that it is not profitable for them to pick up at those small dairy farms in Vermont. And so drop them. Um, and um, it, it's a terrible thing. And these farmers at this point don't know what to do. Um, it, it, it is heartbreaking. It's absolutely heartbreaking. Um, this is a matter of how we have allowed, you know, that large companies are in the driver's seat when it comes to determining uh, the size of our farms and how, to what extent, what the cost of milk should be. Um, and, you know, I, I think that's where farms like myself, we have abandoned the wholesale market a long time ago, we just because we don't trust it. And we only do direct, but that's not available to every farmer. And that's the reality of it all. Um, this is a much larger question. I think, and this is where we have to start watching, what is Organic Valley going to do? Organic Valley is a cooperative, right? So they're, are they profit driven? But they've been dropping their smaller farms too. They stopped picking up at smaller places because it's not cost effective. So. This is like, because they feel like they have to be able to deliver their milk at a similar cost as Horizon. So we're all in this rat race here. And um, I don't have any, any wisdom for you to offer except my sadness about it all. Yeah. Lynn asks a question about increased cost to the individual farmer, specifically as a result of this act or, or about how much we need we, with changing, how, how much subsidies are there available or would there be available to, to make these kinds of changes? I, I don't really know okay. how much subsidy will be. I mean, this, this act hasn't been passed, but it is a significant amount of money that would be available to make some of these changes. Um, and it's not just agricultural, right? Because we're talking about, you know, there's, there are other aspects in this bill that, surpass agriculture, right? It's also forest management and everything else. Right, right, yeah. Land yeah. use in general, I guess. Well, we thank you very much for your wisdom on this. This has been really <laughs> helpful. Well, you know, your insight. No, you, no, you, no wisdom. You, okay, okay. <laughs> well, it felt wise to me. Um, right. um, and and yeah, th this is, um, as, it, as with most things, um, there is, it is much more complex than simple solutions would have it. Um, yep. And we need to be uh, like Rebecca, alert to, to all the ramifications of this. Thank you so much for mm -hmm. coming to help illuminate it for us. All right, okay. okay. All right, thank you. Right, um, bye. bye. And now we're gonna turn to Eric Weltman, uh, familiar to at least some, if not many of you a senior organizer with Food and Water Watch. He's got 30 years experience building successful campaigns around progressive action on environmental and social justice, published widely, trained widely. And right now passing the End Polluter Welfare Act is in his sights. So Eric, uh, uh, talk about right. that. What would it be accomplished if that were to pass? All right, so I've got, I've got a whole presentation right now, but Feel free to chime in if folks have questions. Um, so again, Eric Weltman, Brooklyn-based senior organizer with Food and Water Watch. I do want to extend an immense amount of gratitude to Sarah for being such an amazing activist and ally. Um, 
really very, very important part of our, our movement here in New York. I am going to make liberal use of the chat, chat so to speak, to um, post links and other resources. So please pay attention to that. I'm going to start with my email address. Um, so organizing is all about relationships. Um, and I want to encourage you folks to reach out if you have any questions, want more information. Um, Food and Water Watch, uh, in a nutshell, was actively involved in a successful fight to ban fracking in New York, Woohoo! which folks may be familiar with. Um, we continue to pose fossil fuel infrastructure, including pipelines and power plants that transport and burn frack gas and advocate moving off of fossil fuels. I'm going to put in the chat if you want more info about the org, um, our website and our Facebook page. That is our, our New York uh, Facebook page. Um, so there's a link to the website and the Facebook page. Um, so one key front, um, as Sarah alluded to in this effort, is halting federal subsidies to fossil fuels which currently amount to about $15 billion a year, which is absolutely nuts. It's, um, you know, the fact that we're taxpayers are handing out all this money to companies that are literally, literally fueling the climate crisis. Uh, thanks to federal loopholes that have been on the books for, for years, many oil and gas companies can deduct the majority of the costs associated with drilling new wells meaning they pay almost nothing for fossil fuel extraction. And I'm going to put um, in the chat uh, a brief, not really even an article, just a brief sort of fact sheet that um, summarizes uh, some of these uh, subsidies. Uh, so that link is in the chat. Um, lots of links. Um, so again, as you know, Sarah mentioned toward that end, We've been championing the End Polluter Welfare Act and recruiting co-sponsors for the bill. Um, so I'll put that bill in the chat as well. But it's um, a House resolution or HR 2102. So 2102, that is the bill number. And again, I'm putting that in the chat as well. And that's the link to the congress.gov uh, website. It's, uh, I checked out religiously for our, our various bills to see where we're, uh, how we're doing in terms of, of co-sponsors. And as I mentioned earlier, by the way, we're doing very well with getting uh, New York co-sponsors on the Farm System Reform Act, which is our um, agriculture reform bill that we worked on with um, Cory Booker from New York. As it happens, our incoming mayor, Eric Adams, is a vegan um and is actively um concerned with uh uh corporate agriculture so he's actually supporting the farm system reform act which i think helped us get a whole bunch of those uh, co-sponsors um but as you can see on this bill we currently have um just five co-sponsors but we want and we need more now in terms of action steps um I'm going to post a link. I know you folks are involved, you know, intimately in, 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 in pursuing meetings and reaching out to members of Congress and so forth. But one um, action step that I will put in the chat is we have an online, not really a petition, but a, a tool for, for emailing members of Congress. So that's certainly something that you could, you know, spend maybe 10, 15 seconds on. You know, clicking on and signing if you wanted to uh, this evening, but perhaps more importantly, you know, it's something that you might want to share with others, um, you know, as a vehicle for engaging them and, and encouraging them at the very least to send a, you know, sort of a quick and dirty message, so to speak, uh, in support of, of this bill. Um, now, at the same time, though, um, we've been pushing at that when we've been pushing the standalone bill we have a very timely opportunity to stop these dangerous subsidies, which is the infrastructure bill. Um, that is the Build Back Better Act, which has the potential, you know, hopefully to chart a new course for our nation, moving off fossil fuels from renewable energy. Unfortunately, the bad news, and there is some good news, but 
We've got a bunch of bad news <laughs> um, first. The House leadership really failed to meet the moment. They advanced the act without removing loopholes and tax breaks that, you know, funnel billions of dollars to the fossil fuel industry. I'm going to put, I'm sorry if I'm inundating you with links, but we've got a lot of really hopefully helpful, instructive, informative resources. Um, I'm putting it in, uh, in the chat a press release that we issued when the House Ways and Means Committee, um, which is chaired by Richie Neal up in Massachusetts, but uh, Tom Swazi from Long Island is a, is a key member. Uh, so if any folks are from Long Island, uh, Tom Swazi did not play a helpful role in, in um, opposing fossil fuel subsidies. Um, so to make matters worse, the House bill contains billions of dollars in new subsidies for industry sc scams like carbon capture, hydrogen, and factory farm gas. So that's something worth highlighting when we talk about, you know, subsidies to the fossil fuel industry. They include, you know, as mentioned in this article that I posted earlier, it includes, you know, tax breaks, research and development. I mean, there are literally dozens of forms in which these um that you know these subsidies to add up to 15 billion but we're also concerned now more than ever with um these you know we call them false solutions or non-solutions that would ma maintain our reliance on dirty fossil fuels so that's something that you know worth emphasizing as i mentioned you know they include carbon capture and hydrogen and factory farm gas which by the way gets back to the earlier issue about you know, perpetuating uh, the, the, the industrial agriculture system, that is not something I think any of us on this call have an interest in doing. So I'm going to post two more articles, um, one of which is um, by my colleague Jim Walsh. He published a wonderful piece in Common Dreams about how the Build Back Better Act could actually undermine climate action, including, you know, as I mentioned, these uh, subsidies for fossil fuel for fo fossil fuels and false solutions and then a uh, piece in the intercept which i believe um totals um these new subsidies to be, uh, upwards of 25 billion dollars for these false solutions so that's a lot of money that could be going towards perpetuating our reliance on fossil fuels. So the good news, the really good news, is that we have a potential hero in our corner, a possible champion who could rise to the occasion and you know, save the day. And that is none other than Chuck Schumer, our US Senator and Majority Leader. Um, I'm putting in the chat uh, two pieces. One is an op-ed piece that my colleague Alex Beecham published a couple weeks ago in the Westchester newspaper, and then a press release about a really fun action that we did this Friday evening um, in Park Slope outside of uh, Senator Schumer's apartment building. We did what we call a die-in um, to encourage him to not just say the right thing, but actually do the right thing. Um, as folks may be aware, uh, Senator Schumer is up for re-election next year. Between you and me, I think his prospects are really good. Um, you know, he makes a point of visiting every county. Um, he really does, to be honest, I think he enjoys his job and it, and it shows in the way he you know, interacts with people. But he is concerned about a primary you know, perhaps from, you know, AOC or maybe Sarah Gronin, but, <laughs> well, maybe not. <laughs> you don't want to run for Senate? All right, maybe we'll get Charlie to, to yeah. run. Uh, Mary Jane, you want to run for Senate against Chuck Schumer? No, nah, not so much. All right, but, but nonetheless, I mean, to be honest, I don't think there's, you know, a real threat emerging. Uh, but he's, you know, like all good incumbents, he's running scared. And so, you know, he's, you know, at least in terms of what he's saying, he's, he's moving to the left, uh, in part, you know, again, to ward off a potential primary. So 
one way to influence Schumer is to get more cow, co, New York House members to co-sponsor this bill and show him that you know New York members of Congress and the people um, really care about this issue. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, someone mentioned earlier that you guys scored a uh, success in getting Carol, Carolyn Maloney on the bill, which is awesome, which is absolutely awesome. I see uh, Rebecca, you know, giving a cheer. Well, guess what? Carolyn Maloney is also uh, is facing a primary challenger, and she is running scared. And I'm getting you know emails from her, and she's got all these celebrities endorsing her, and um, you know the governor is doing a, a fundraiser for her in Brooklyn in a couple weeks, and we're going to be there. Um, so Carolyn Maloney is 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 doing the right thing, and she's also I'm going to share a tweet that she sent out. Um, and, you know, regardless of what her motivations may be, this is leadership, uh, you know, not just co-sponsoring the bill, but tweeting about it. And, and, and I encourage folks, if you, if you have a Twitter account, you know, click on this link. Um, I mean, I can even, um, I'm going to look at it right now. Um, it's a great, I mean, it's a great tweet. You know, the U.S. gives the fossil fuel industry over 20 billion in subsidies every year. Over 96% of the value of those subsidies goes to enhancing profits. Um, so that's, that's, that is leadership. You know, again, it's not just a matter of, you know, adding your name to a bill, but really being public. Um, and so that's what we need from our House members is not just co-sponsoring the bill, but really speaking out about the issue um, you know, tweeting like Representative Maloney did, and, and we're keeping track of all these tweets. You know, we work very closely with Friends of the Earth, another great you know national organization that's been doing a lot of work on this issue. As this Greenpeace, I mean, there's a lot of organizations um, that we work with um, that are you know concerned with this issue and have been leaning on Senator Schumer in particular. And again, one of the ways to do that that is to elevate the voices of our House members like Representative Maloney. Um, the final thing, I'm the, my, the last thing, the very last thing I'm going to post in the chat. My God, post a lot of things tonight. Um, well, I'm going to post this. We have a hotline to Senator Schumer, and I want to encourage everybody, please call him. Um, the number, it's in the chat, I think it's 866-961-4293. Um, please uh, let me, you know, please call him, leave a message. You can even do so tonight. The final thing I'll just, I know we've had, I think one or two people join in the course of my presentation. I'm gonna put my email address in again. I'm more than happy to you know email out email out all these links. I know it was a lot to digest. You know, obviously amenable to taking questions, but please um, also you know email me if you if you we, if we don't get to everything tonight, or if you as is very likely the case, if you ask me a question that I don't know the answer to, I can certainly find out from one of our experts. There we go. Woo! We're gonna do it. We're gonna win, right? Let's hear it. Come on. Yeah, Unmute yeah, yourselves. Yeah, Let's hear it. Charlie. Woo. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. I love I Rebecca, you're I love your I love your spirit. Look, you've got your hand raised. You're all excited. We need to bottle of that energy. Okay, got a question or a comment, yeah, Rebecca? Go ahead. Yep. Um, so my question related to this proposal is sort of it seems like there's a lot of universities that have, I saw Harvard recently, and I think the University of California just announced today and Minnesota are all divesting from fossil fuels. How does that, does that help show leadership that like people want to see more of this? Like, how does that tie into everything that's going on with this bill? That's a good question. Um, I think it was, may have been Bill McKibben way back when who said, it's not so much just the, the amount of money that they're investing, though, in the case of you know, Harvard. I mean, they've got a pretty big endowment. It's really, um, you know, staining the industry, uh, you know, like tobacco, um, you know, staining. Um, 
I mean, it's really saying that this is a dirty industry that people should be touching. Um, so whether or not it has much of an impact on their, you know, share value, or I mean, I don't know much of anything about the, the world of finance, but absolutely, you know, having prominent institutions, and it hardly gets more prominent than Harvard, right? I mean, the, having prominent institutions invest um, is as much, I think, about, you know, staining the industry. Then in the case, you know, when you get a city or a state like New York, I mean, that probably has an impact on the bottom line as well. But I think it's more about, you know, staining the industry. Oh, Sarah, you have a question. I, I do. And, and this is about, um, you know, we work with other um, activists, right? And we, to us, it's uh, preaching to the choir, right? Mm -hmm. in, informing, enlightening people who are ready to be enlightened, right? And I wonder about um, reaching people who are unaware that this is a problem. Um, yeah, um, growing, growing the capacity for being pissed, essentially, or you know. Well, so there's there's really three there, there's three kinds of people. There's those who are against you. And those I would never spend um, a minute's time, though I was tabling, by the way, at the Atlantic Annex, and someone chastised me for getting into like a five, 10 minute debate with someone who was <laughs> never going to sign our petition. And that that was a, appropriate a chastisement because I don't know, just part of me wanted to get into it and I wasted 10 minutes and, you know, that was that. Um, but I shouldn't have. Right. Um, so you shouldn't waste time with people who are, are um, you know, against you. There's the people that are sort of, you know, in between, on the fence, that could be engaged. And then there's those who are with you, but really um, could be readily and easily engaged. So in some ways, I think that the best use of our time is engaging the hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, you know, here in New York and, and otherwise, they're already informed, already interested, already care, but don't necessarily have the tools. So that's why, I mean, in organizing, we, we talk about a ladder of engagement. So you guys are, you're at the top, right? I mean, you're at the top of the ladder, so to speak. I see. Charlie, do you have a ladder in the background there? Yes. Yeah, that's that's your ladder of engagement that you climbed you climbed up. Uh, I mean, I know. Look, I, as Sarah mentioned, I know some of you. I mean, Charlie's been. I mean, you, you guys are leaders, right? So you're at the, literally at the top of the ladder. I think you know the value of online petitions isn't necessarily you know their impact, but it's an entry point. Um, it's how you it's how you get on an email list and and. And, you know, it's, it's how you get invited to meetings and so forth. So I think that's, that's, you know, sort of, sort of answer your question, I would think less in terms of the amorphous, you know, masses of people and, you know, though we certainly, you know, do spend a fair amount of time, you know, petitioning, um, you know, and, and building our lists. But I, I think it's as much about, you know, engaging your friends, your family, your neighbors, the people that you know, they're already aware, but don't necessarily know how to take action and giving them, you know, like the, this, you know, this toll free, the H66 number. I mean, that's, you know, a tangible, easy thing that you can ask someone to do, you know, make a call and then ask them to share it. So, um, you know, similar, you know, same thing with a petition, you, you get someone to sign it and then you say, Hey, could you ask another 10 people to sign it? So I think it's, it's, it's as much about giving people, you know, entry points to activism, um, you know, making it accessible, um, you know, Saul Alinsky, if, if folks familiar with Saul Alinsky, he was considered like one of the, like the godfather of organizing from the south side of Chicago. And one of his phrases I love is you start where people are at. And that applies in, in all kinds of things, including, you know, take, you know, accepting from people what they can give. If they can give $5, that's awesome. If they can give $500, that's maybe even more awesome. But, you know, it's our jobs and it's it's not easy, but, you know, to the extent that we can tailor 
the activism um, to what people are able to do where they're at. I mean, there's lots of people that have, you know, two jobs or, you know, a bunch of kids or whatever, busy lives, and they're not able to get on Zoom calls like this. Uh, for people like that, that's, you give them the online petition. But I'm sorry, that was a, uh, this is getting to be a very long winded answer. But um, I mean, I think that that is our jobs is as much as we can tailor the ask to the individual that you're talking to a busy neighbor, or maybe someone who's retired and has a lot of time. Um, yeah, that's I think so it's all about I think it's really about it. It's it's less in some ways, it's less about educating and more about engaging. That was a, quite a rant, but <laughs> I agree, Eric. I think as someone who who just oh. engaged with with climate crisis like earlier this year, you know, like I just remember feeling like okay, things are obviously going very wrong in our on our planet, but I don't know even where to start or what the actual like legislative um, uh, issues are. Right. Like, obviously, I know that carbon, you know, carbon dioxide concentration is, you know, higher than it's ever been. But how do yeah. we actually fix that in terms of legislation? What do we do on a state level? Obviously, here we're focused on a federal level. But, you know, six months ago, I had no idea and what any of those things were. Any of these. It's uh, so confusing. I mean, how do you, yeah. you know, I get regular briefings on this stuff. And sometimes I walk away more confused than I was at the start. Um, I mean, it's messy, right? I mean, politics, I mean, you see what's going on in DC with the speaker and the, I mean, it's, it's, it's messy stuff. Um, but you know, that's what we got to work with. Um, and I think it's hard. I mean, you know, it's, it's hard to make it digestible and, and give people, you know, easy, as I said, easy entry points, but you know, I mean, there are, you know, I, I have an immense amount of admiration. I mean, Sarah does incredible work with 350 Brooklyn. I think to some extent she, you know, utilizes resources from her national organization, but you know, you've got a lot of, you know, it's not just Food and Water Watch, there's Friends of the Earth, there's Greenpeace, you know, we're national organizations that, you know, we're not like, you know, drowning in money, but we have resources. We have, you know, fact sheets and emails and stuff like that. So I think you, 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 you kind of take as you are tonight, you know, you, you take from the different organizations and, you know, utilize the resources and the tools that we have. I think Sarah actually, in terms of packaging resources, the 350 Brooklyn newsletter is one of the best I've ever seen. One of the best. Thanks. Though it's not, not, you know, I'm just one of the small players in that. So it's, it's always, you know, it always takes a lot of people, a lot of people doing little bits and, and you get stuff done, right? Um, so it's very accessible. I mean, that's a hard thing. I mean, I think Sarah does an amazing job or the whole organization does an amazing job in presenting, you know, opportunities for action in a very digestible way. Rebecca. Yeah, I have another question. Um, I've started to get more active in my daughter's school. And given that we've been um, leading the efforts pretty well here with our New York 12 team and gotten um, Carolyn Maloney to sign on to this bill. How do you, like, I'm assuming most of the parents at our school are probably part of District 12. Um, is it like, as you approach new groups that are sort of in the same area where our representatives already signed on to these things, is it worth introducing them to the other bills that we want her to sign on to, or do we sort of continue to focus on this and hope that you're catching yeah. other districts that are maybe on the outskirts that, you know, what's the so, approach there that you so recommend? Here's, that's a very good question. And I realize I don't want to infringe on people's time, but I know it is almost eight o'clock, but so think about the ladder of engagement. Well, it's a very similar thing with the bills. Remember I talked about, you know, Carolyn Maloney sending that tweet. I mean, that's amazing. So, you know, get, I mean, to be honest, it's, it's, it can be, you know, <laughs> more work than it should be just to get their name on a bill, but that's just the start. They should be sending tweets. They should be speaking about it. They should be doing op-ed pieces. They should be you're recruiting other co-sponsors. They should be speaking out. I mean, so, you know, someone like a Carolyn Maloney who 
you know, is, to be honest, I mean, she's vulnerable. I mean, she's worried about losing her job. So, you know, anything you can think to ask of her, you should ask her. You know, ask her to give a speech. Ask her to host an event. Ask her to speak to your group. Um, I mean, but I mean, by the way, I mean, she would be glad for the visibility. I mean, suggest an op-ed piece on, on climate change. I'm sure she'd do it. Um, you know, so I think it, it's, it's, again, in some ways, what we need, we need champions. You know, and same thing in our activism, right? I mean, you know, people who signed the online petition, I mean, we want, I mean, by the way, I mean, I, Food and Water Watch has, you know, a million people or something like that on our email list. And that's awesome, but it's the Sarah Gronins of the world that are really gold, right? You know, it's it's people like you that, you know, so really active people. And again, it's the same thing with legislation. Is it's great to have you know, people co-sponsor a bill, but even more so, like being like active champions. That's the real gold. Um, I mean, you want co-sponsors for sure. I mean, we more co-sponsors the better. But, you know, as you know, and I know this more, I think, intimately on, on the state level, when you're trying to move a bill through the legislature, you need bunches of legislators to go to the speaker and say, because by the way, I don't even, I don't know the numbers, but, you know, an average legislator may co-sponsor dozens, if not hundreds of bills, because it's easy, actually, it's easy to do. You don't even... I mean, it probably takes a minute of someone, an aide, like typing in, blah, blah, blah. But to say it's a priority and go to the speaker and speak out, that's what we're looking for. That's how bills get passed. It's not just by having, you know, dozens or hundreds or whatever co-sponsors, by, by having legislators say to the speaker, to the majority leader, I've got, you know, 10 priorities and this is on that list. That's what you need. That's what, and, and, you know, problem is it, it's hard to know whether they're really doing that. I mean, the more tangible, I mean, a tweet, you know, I put it, I clearly, you know, you can share a tweet and say, Hey, Maloney did, did this, whether or not someone talks to the leadership about something, you know, that's a little, unless you see a letter, like, unless, you know, you can say, you know, you can say Maloney. And this would be actually this would be huge if you said to Maloney write a letter to the Speaker of the House saying get rid of fossil fuel subsidies and say and you don't you know because people say all the time um, I'm going to talk to the Speaker about this well you don't really know if they did but if you ask them to write a letter say hey, can I have a copy of that letter so that's what we're looking for leadership that's what we're looking for leadership that's a great way to yeah, you know, sum the sum this up. Um, yeah, we need more Sarah Gronitz. Right. Uh, yeah, more, yeah, yeah, more yeah. Charlie Olsons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We moved yeah, a whole that's... band of people, right? In the in this in this boat. I could um, use I could use maybe one more Charlie Olson. <laughs> no more, um, no more than that. Yeah. Way too kind. <laughs> Charlie, you're one of my favorite people. You know that. <laughs> Way too. Um, um, Eric. Thank you so much for, for this. This was very helpful. These were two very different speakers, right? With very different perspectives, but I hope it helped everybody feel like they have a better grip on, on what we're trying to accomplish with these separate bills here. Um, uh, it's so wonderful, uh, Jean, Jean Paul and, and Eric, that you gave us your time like this. No, we really, really thank you very much for it. And I thank um, you because you are all very, 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 very important people. Yeah. And together we are going to win. Yeah, they are great. They're a great bunch of people here. Um, terrific. And um, it's eight o'clock, so we will sum it up. And thank you very much. Round it up. Amen. And you'll get you'll all get emailed me from me in the morning. All right. Good. All right. Amen. Have a good night, everybody. Bye. Bye.